This conference will now be recorded. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry, good morning, everyone. Uh, we will start the session. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. yes we will. Can you hear me, those attending online? Yes, we can hear you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. He is audible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think I was in mute. Okay, so we will be starting with the DDR technology training. Uh, so in the following slides, I'll explain how I plan to do uh, various parts of the DDR uh, generation training. Okay. Uh, so this is the DDR course overview. Uh, the training is offered as three different courses because you see that DDR is a a uh, quite vast course vast subject i mean if you start from ddr till ddr5 and even starting from lp ddr to lp ddr5 it's a very vast topic so it is very difficult to cover so many topics in a limited time of let's say 30 hours or 20 hours it's very difficult to cover so hence what we have done is we have divided them into three different courses one is a course that focuses on ddr to L ddr4 and lp ddr to lp ddr4 there is another course which is only focused on DDR5 and there is a course which is focused on DDR3 controller functional verification. So the first part is for 35 hours and uh, that will be going on for five weeks and uh, even this training is starting from today itself. I mean today means today is like the demo session and from tomorrow onwards we will be having this course also running. And the fee for this course is mentioned here. Live training is 9,000 plus GST. E-learning is 7.5 plus GST. I mean, the fee is proportional to the number of weeks that is being spent on the training. Okay. Uh, DDR5 training will be for 21 hours. It will go for three weeks. It's like you can say seven hours per week, uh, per day, three and a half hours, and Saturday and Sunday. It's a weekend course only. Everything is weekends only course. And we will have... Uh, uh, the session timings will be in the mornings. Okay. Uh, or what, if we plan to do both of them, one will be in the morning, one will be in the uh, post lunch schedule. And here I have given the fee for this DDR5. And uh, the DDR3 controller functional verification using system verilog and UVM, it is a 30 hours course that will go for four weeks. Uh, and the fee also I have mentioned here. I mean, it is just to give you an overview of what how the course is being distributed into three different aspects uh, reason is if i try to do all these things in let's say 30 hours it is not possible actually i'll be running through each and every topic probably you won't be able to understand a lot of things if i go very fast and i try to cover everything in 30 hours so for that reason i had to divide it into two different courses one is this one is this one next so let us talk about that. What is the agenda for the first course? That is DDR2, DDR4 and LP DDR2, LP DDR4 course. So the first we'll be starting off with understanding the significance of DDR in SOC. Then we'll be talking about memory basics, uh, like what is SDRAM, what is SRAM, how they differ. Then we'll be talking about how DDR has evolved. I mean, why do we need DDR5? I mean, why, do, why would we require DDR6? All those topics we'll be talking about. Then we'll be talking about DRAM cell and device architecture. Then we'll talk about DDR wrapper architecture for different generations. And then we'll be talking about DDR packaging. Then we'll be talking about DDR frequently used terms. 
then we'll talk about various timing parameters in the ddr and uh, then we'll be talking about ddr verilog model simulations where we run the simulations and we analyze the timing uh, waveforms for different uh, parameters then we'll be discussing about ddr pinout description then we'll also talk about ddr addressing uh, ddr state diagram and initialization sequence i mean this will be done for when i say ddr verilog models it will be done for all the models when i say pinout description it will be done for all the models so addressing like that everything i say is meant for all the generations of ddr i mean ddr ddr2 ddr3 and ddr4 then we'll be talking about ddr command truth table i mean what are the various types of ddr commands and how does the truth table look like then we'll be talking about uh, the mode registers uh, in different generations of the ddr then we'll be talking about uh, what is the concept of delay locked loop uh, the ddr how do we take care of ddr signal integrity then we'll be talking about on delay termination then we'll be talking about zq calibration okay then we'll be talking about calibration in ddr i mean what are the different types of calibration in ddr uh, then we'll be talking about uh, refresh what is the concept of refresh what is auto refresh what is self refresh then we'll talk about the power down concept in uh, ddr uh, then we'll be talking about uh, ddr features i mean starting from ddr till ddr4 how the features has evolved i mean what are the features how the things got updated in ddr2 how things got updated in ddr3 and same thing for ddr4 so once it is done we'll be talking about lp ddr specific features lp ddr lp ddr2 lp ddr3 and lp ddr4 then finally we'll be talking about uh, the dfi which stands for ddr phi interface then we'll be talking about ddr controller overview i mean what how exactly a ddr controller looks like what are the sub components how does it interfaces with the system knock how does it interfaces with the ddr wrapper all those things will be talking then we'll be discussing about ddr controller from soc level verification perspective so this is the first part of the course the second aspect that is the second course that is focused on only on ddr5 it will be focused on ddr5 changes with respect to ddr4 i mean compared to ddr4 how the ddr5 has evolved so the people who are going to enroll for ddr5 training it is expected that they are expert with ddr4 i mean only if you are expert not just ddr you should be expert with ddr4 only then you should go for ddr5 training otherwise lot of ddr5 itself has lot of new things which are which have which when you compare with ddr4 itself ddr5 has lot of new things so if you don't know ddr if you don't know ddr4 it will be very difficult for me to teach ddr5 alone so whom this training is meant for the, it is meant for the people who are who are already working in the industry who are already working on ddr verification i mean they have a good expertise with ddr till ddr4 so that for those people this training is meant so what is covered as part of ddr5 training so first we'll be starting off with the functional description i mean how does ddr5 work and then we'll be talking about ddr5 pinout assignments i mean how the ddr5 uh, the pins uh, have changed with respect to ddr4 everything you see will be explained and will be also compared with respect to ddr4 how it has got evolved i mean how the things got changed then we'll be talking about ddr5 addressing okay i mean including that uh, there is a concept of three three dimensional structure 3ds model what is the concept of 3ds in ddr5 all those things will be talking about then we'll be talking about reset and initialization sequence uh then we'll be talking about the mode registers again you see you see the same things everywhere even in the previous slide you saw command description and operation right even in the previous slide you saw ddr5 ddr addressing you saw pinout assignments see every generation you will be learning the common set of things but our main focus is how the things changed from ddr to ddr2 uh, how it changed from ddr3 how it changed to ddr4 how it changed to ddr5 but then in every generation they add few additional things which are not there in the previous generation for example in ddr3 they might have added odt they might have added gq calibration in ddr4 they have added bank groups so like that there are new things keep getting added 
in every generation to take care of the the evolving back bandwidth requirements and to take care of the signal integrity so we'll be talking about more of that going forward other than that we'll be talking about two cycle two cycle command cancel concept then we'll be talking about multi purpose commands uh, then we'll be talking about two n mode and we'll be talking about cs uh, chip select gear down mode and we'll be talking about activate command precharge command burst length burst type and burst order then we'll be talking about various io features and modes then the concept of programmable preamble and postamble then we'll be talking about on die ecc concept we'll talk about different operations like write operations re, uh, read operations uh, then there are uh, ddr5 has this concept of temperature sensors uh, then we talk about refresh operation self refresh operation the concept of input clock frequency change uh, then we'll be talking about power down mode the, then ddr5 has a concept called as maximum power saving mode then we'll talk about connectivity test mode zq calibration commands per dram addressability uh, then finally we'll be talking about chip select training mode uh, ca command address bus training mode write leveling training mode read training pattern read preamble training mode and post and we'll be finally talking about post package repair memory bist uh, post package repair that is what we call as MPPR and we'll be talking about on die termination concept and the loop back mode so this is all what is planned for the advanced course which will go for around 21 hours now this 21 hours we have come up with the assumption that you are already good with these concepts with respect to DDR4 so only then you should be taking this course if you are not good with these things I would suggest you to go for the basic course which is from ddr to ddr4 and for pr all practical reasons that would be more than sufficient for you what do i mean by that let's say you are working in a project soc project you and every soc you see has a ddr you cannot think of an soc without a ddr i mean it is impossible i would say uh, in, uh, rather i should instead of saying impossible i mean in 99.999 percent cases we will have ddr in every soc we will talk about what is the reason why ddr is required in every soc uh, the second thing would be for in that means what every test case you develop will more or less have will be accessing the ddr so what is that means is since every soc has ddr okay so any test case you develop SV develop will involve access to DDR in majority cases. I mean, say in majority cases at SOC level, basically. I'm talking about SOC level verification, I'm not talking about IP level verification. So, in those cases, it is very important to have the basic understanding of the DDR. So, what is the understanding of DDR? I'm talking about, I'm talking about this level of understanding where you understand. Uh, the D DRAM architecture, wrapper architecture, the concept of uh, how the timing diagrams looks like, what is the pinout description, how the how do we do D DDR addressing, how does that state diagram look like, these kind of concepts you should be familiar with. So, uh, if you are if you are into an SOC verification, or even if you, let's say you are looking for a new opportunities, I mean you are planning to move into a better better career. So in all those cases, DDR knowledge is very essential because every SOC has the DDR and uh, the knowledge of DDR is essential for you to work into any SOC. So this course does give you a little uh, basics about uh, how do we do DDR controller verification at the SOC level perspective also. Even if you don't work into, even if you don't, even if you do not work on DDR controller verification, you still require DDR knowledge because let's say you are working on some USB test. The USB test eventually will involve either re, it will involve reading to DDR or writing to DDR. I mean, most of the use cases that you develop 
will have invo will involve access to the DDR. So at that time you need to understand how do I look into the waveform? How do I understand what operation is going on? What command is being issued? Why the things are not, uh, why the read data is not coming? Why the writes are not happening? To debug all those things, you need to have the good understanding of the DDR. So with this understanding, let us proceed further. Now, the third part of the course that will be third aspect, third category of the course in DDR is DDR3 controller function verification using SV and UVM. See, many people have been approaching me to offer a course on DDR3 controller verification. Uh, so I thought, uh, I mean, uh, why, why don't we offer one? Because we didn't had this course so far, but I'm planning to offer this course where we cover all the aspects of DDR3 controller verification, starting from the design specification to regression setup and coverage analysis. But here it is expected that you are already good with the DDR3 protocol. I mean, I'm not going to teach what is a command, what is a bank, what is a row, what is a uh, pre-charge, what is activate, all those concepts I'm not going to teach in this course. It is directly going to start from the spec and we are going to directly enter into the reading of the specification where during the first week of this training, we understand the design by reading through the spec, list down the features, scenarios, come up with the test bench architecture and test plan. Then you list out the functional coverage points. Then in the second week, we are going to work on developing the test plan. Then we develop the test bench components. Then we do test bench component integration. Then we work on sanity test case coding and bringing up the sanity test case. Then the third week we are going to work on test bench component coding like scoreboard and checkers, then functional functional test case coding and debug. There we learn some debugging techniques. How do we debug into DDR3 controller kind of designs uh, by means of RTL tracing and uh, tool schematic tracing. Then the fourth week will be focused on developing additional test cases, uh, regression setup and regression report generation. Uh, then we'll be focusing on functional and code coverage report generation and analysis. Then we'll be working on improving the coverage and closing the coverage. I mean, we may not close the coverage, but these are the few things we'll be focusing on. I mean, we'll be talking about what is it involved in improving the coverage overall. So this is a third category of the course in DDR training. Now, uh, other than this DDR courses, uh, at VLS Guru, we do offer various uh, memory focused courses. Like we offer courses on ACE protocol, which is related to the concept of cache and cache coherency. We also offer courses on NVMe, NVM Express, uh, Universal Flash Storage, DDR, uh, concept of SCSI protocol, UASP protocol. So all these courses are also available, which are related to the memory devices. Now, let us now get into the DDR technology training. So as I said, uh, today I'll be starting off with the basics because I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the DDR advanced concepts. So I would be starting off with the introduction to the DDR. Uh, then if someone has any queries specific to the advanced courses like DDR5 and DDR3 controller verification, I will also address those questions. So first, let us start off with understanding the significance of the DDR in an SOC. I mean, wh what is the importance of DDR? Uh, see, if you can you take a look at the diagram below? What do you see in the diagram? You see, we have a CPU. It can be any processor. It could be x86 based processor. It could be the ARM based processor. It could be AMD processor, anything for that matter. You see, it has got a cache memory associated with it. I mean, every CPU has a L1 cache and L2 cache, sometimes L3 cache also associated with them. Then we have got the RAM. So this RAM is what we are calling as the DDR. Okay. Then we have got hard disk. Now hard disk can be HDD, it can be SSD, solid state drive or hard disk drive. Now, what do you understand from this diagram? You see that the first, whenever CPU wants to access something, first it checks with the cache memory. See this arrow, it checks if the content is available in the cache. If it doesn't find that, where does it go? It goes to RAM. It checks whether the content is available in the RAM. If it is not available, then the request is request goes to hard disk. But the thing is that there is no direct connection between CPU and hard disk. There is no direct connection between CPU and solid state drive. It is the DDR which acts like an interface. Anything that you want to access, it is always moved into 
DDR. Anything that you want to access. Let's say you have one movie file, one gigabyte movie file you want to access. It would be always moved into DDR. From there, it will be accessed. Okay, That is the important thing you need to remember. That is why DDR is very significant because the CPU accesses memory only as a DDR. This becomes a secondary memory. Okay, It's like a, uh, what is that called as? Uh, backup memory. I, I wouldn't use the term backup memory because the CPU doesn't directly do any write reads to the hard disk. So every SOC, I mean, what, what is the significance of DDR is every SOC use case involves access to the memory. Let's say you are talking over the phone. Okay, you're sending an SMS, you're playing a game. Every SOC use case that you use in your mobile phone or any electronic device for that matter, it will always involve access to the memory. Okay, initially when system boots, initially when system boots, where is, where is all the data is present? Can someone tell me, let's say you take your laptop, you just turn on your laptop by pressing the power on button. What will happen? Where is the data present? Is the data present in the cache? Can someone tell me? Is the data present in the cache? All the applications and uh, all the data that you want to run, is it present in the cache? It is not present no, in the cache. Is it present in the RAM? Is it present in uh, RAM? It no. is not even present in the RAM because when you, as soon as you turn off the power, this will lose the charge. This will lose the charge. So there won't be anything here. There won't be anything here. Then where is the data present? Where is all your applications and where is all your data present? When I say data, it could be some uh, documents. It could be some movie files. It could be some other uh, files, right? Photos or anything. Where is it all present? Where is that, that whole information is present? That whole information is present in storage device it is all present in the hard disk drive now of course there will be a rom where some initial boot boot part of the thing will be present because that will tell initial booting part then it will involve access to the cache and it will not access to the ram but all the when any when the system boots where is all the data that is that is required is present it is all present in the hard disk and it could be partly in the rom so all the data is present in either HDD or SSD. The, what is mean by all the data? It includes the applications, that is the instructions and the data. The data, what is mean by data? Photos, the movie files, songs, the documents, everything. Then other than, uh, then what happens is once you boot your system, the operating system comes up. As part of that, what it does is it loads the cache with something called as page tables basically i mean there will be a page cache will be there page tables will be created and the page tables will be present in my ddr memory also uh, these page tables will tell how the hard disk should be accessed for now let's only focus on that much i mean let's not go into going deep of what is page table and how the page table does the virtual address to physical address translation let's not get into it for now understand that as soon as you boot up your laptop, what happens is very first thing operating system does is corresponding to each of your applications. Let's say Microsoft Office. Let's say uh, your uh, some startup applications will be there, right? M uh, uh, MS Teams. Okay, some Skype application, different things. They are all installed here. Those applications and data is present here. That will be moved into the DDR. Initially, that is what happens when you load the, um, when you boot up the operating system. That Then once the data is moved, it will create something called as page tables, which tells where the information is present, basically. Okay. Uh, what uh, What is page table is, it's like it tells whatever address is issued, how that address should be translated into the DDR address. That is what we call as the page table. This address is called as virtual address. This address is called as physical address. The page tables will tell how this virtual address to physical address translation should be done. Then uh, DDR is the primary memory that is directly accessible by the CPU. See, DDR cannot access, uh, sorry, CPU uh, cannot access the hard disk. CPU can only access the DDR. Uh, it is comprised of DRAM. 
and provides the actual working space to the processor i mean anything that it wants let's say you are you are now i'm presenting a ppt you see where where do you think that ppt is loaded in my laptop can you tell me is my cpu accessing from the cache or is it accessing from the ram or is it accessing from the cpu can you uh, hard disk can someone tell me it, it should be in uh, ram however ram should be uh, fetching it, it from the hard disk. most probably first check for cache memory if it is pre if the application con uh, application information is present in the cache memory it will check if it doesn't find there that is called as a miss cache miss then the request goes to ram if it is not found there also that will result in something called as page fault that is called as page fault when page fault happens there will be some dma which will move that page whatever fault happened that page will be moved to here then the access again will happen from the ddr only in all the cases the access will either happen from the cache memory will either happen from the ddr not directly to the hard disk so that is what we mean by ddr is the primary memory that is access directly accessible by cpu next hdd and ssd are the secondary memories whose data first gets transferred to the primary memory then are accessed by the processor processor does not directly interact with the secondary memory so this is called as the primary memory this is called as the secondary memory next uh, let us understand different categories of memory can someone tell me what are the various categories volatile non volatile there are categories memories can be divided in following categories based on how they store the charge how they store the data one is called as volatile type of memories one is called as non volatile type of memories there are two categories of memories one is called as volatile one is called as non volatile so what is difference between volatile what exactly is volatile memory means Till the power is there, then once it will store the data. Remove the power means once I turn off the system, volatile memories lose all the information. They will not hold any information. Whereas non-volatile memories, even if I remove the voltage, they will continue to hold the charge. Now tell me the SSD. Is it volatile or is it non-volatile? Non-volatile. What is SSD? Is it volatile or non-volatile? Non-volatile. Tell me, when you switch off your laptop, do you lose the information on SSD? Let's say right now my laptop has SSD. I turn off my laptop, shut down my laptop. When I turn on laptop, will the data and SSD be there or will it be lost? It will be there. Always there. I expect more participation. I believe 90% of you are experienced people. It will be always there. I believe 90% of you who are attending this training are experienced people. This kind of experience where people don't participate, I get in my fresher courses where they don't know how to talk, so they don't talk. That's not the problem because they are freshly out of college. I don't expect this from experienced people. You are expected to participate and you are expected to make the session interactive. That is when we get a very quality course. Basically, DDR, sorry, SSD is a non-volatile because it doesn't lose the charge. I mean, even if you turn on your turn off your laptop, it retains the charge. Now, what about HDD? It is also non-volatile. What about DDR? Can you tell me what is DDR? I mean, is it volatile or is it non-volatile? It's volatile. Volatile. <clears throat> DDR is volatile because as soon as you turn off the charge it will lose the content so there won't I mean once you shut down your laptop there won't be anything here there won't be anything here only thing that will be there is probably there will be a boot ROM. there the image will be there because it's a read-only memory it will have the image other than that cache and ram will not have anything cache is made up of ssram so ssram is also of type volatile only so now let us see what are the subcategories here see one of the volatile type of types of memories is the cache memory uh, it is also called as primary storage. Uh, SRAM, ROM, and cache. Then we have main memory, which is called as system memory. 
which example of that is DDR. These two are the categories of volatile memory. Uh, so there is a mistake. Oh, sorry, RAM is not volatile in nature. I think I have written it by mistake here. That you can correct. Okay. Next, non-volatile. SSD is a non-volatile. SSD stands for what? Solid state drive. Then other type of non-volatile memories are what? Hard disk drive and magnetic tapes. So this is what I'm referring. This one is these things. This is where all your application and data is present. Then, so how do you compare them? Basically, what happens is uh, as you move from here to here. So to access a cache for processor to access the cache, it takes the smallest time. Let's say it may take one nanosecond, for example. To access this, it may take five nanoseconds. To access this, to get the data from here, it may take 50 nanoseconds. I mean, it could be much more than that. I'm just giving you a comparative analysis. To access something direct that is still directly present in cache, it takes only one nanoseconds. Something that is present in DDR, it takes little more time. Something that is present in hard disk, it takes a lot more time. Let's say it is not available here. That is means page fault. You have to get from here. It takes a lot of time to fill that page. That is the case with these things. Okay. And on the negative side, cost increases. See, cash is costliest. RAM is lower cost, me medium cost. Hard disks are the lowest cost. If you see, if you want to purchase 16 gigabyte uh, memory DDR and 16 gigabyte SSD. Tell me, which one costs more? Tell me. Can you tell me? Whether 16 gigabyte DDR will cost more or SSD will cost more? Can someone tell me? RAM will cost more, I think. DDR, DDR. will cost more, definitely, right? Okay. SSD doesn't cost so much because SSD comes in terabytes. So hence, if you do the gigabyte calculation, this will be cheapest. This will be medium. This will be costliest. That is why they generally keep low, small amount of memory. This medium amount of memory, you see, this will be in megabytes. This will be in gigabytes. Okay, few tens of gigabytes. This will be in hundreds of gigabytes or even terabytes. So because here, uh, even if it is terabyte, the cost is manageable. So this is a brief about different memory categories. Next, let us understand the significance of DDR in SOC architecture. I mean, how the DDR access happens. Uh, Sri, uh, just one of re repetition of what we have done in the previous slides. Okay. If you see how the memory is organized is DDR is also called as system memory. Uh, the unit of data between data transfer between cache and DDR is called as cache line. See, generally what happens, uh, this is an example of a multi-core processor subsystem. See, one core, second core, third core, fourth core. So what is this called as, I mean, if there are four cores, what is, what, what do I call that processor subsystem as? If, if a sub processor subsystem has four cores, what do I call that subsystem as? Quad, quad we call core. it as quad, quad, quad core, core, right? So in this case, the quad core, uh, every quad core has something called as L1 cache. Here, L1 cache, okay. Uh, it okay. could be L1 cache, L1 I cache and D cache also. Instruction cache and data cache. Same thing here, same thing here, same thing here. So there are four L1 caches. Uh, four L1 instruction caches, four L1 data caches. Then we have got for all four cores together, there is one L2 cache. Then they collectively connect to DDR. There will be a DDR controller here. And then finally we have got DMA, uh, sorry, H hard disk drive or SSD connected through either PCI Express or USB or SATA, various protocols will be there. Through that, they will be connected. Don't think that DDR has one interface through which it connects here. No, it's a different different path altogether. So it's just shown here for convenience, but SSD is actually present somewhere here like this. There will be a PCIe controller through which SSD is connected. There could be one USB port through which you have some USB drive connected. They all will become the solid state drives only. So first what happens is when core wants to read a location, let's say it wants to read a location 32 tick H 1000. It will check whether that location is present in the L1 cache. If it is present, good, it will get the data. If it is not present, where does the request go to? Can someone tell me? If the 
that address location is not present in the cache whom does that request go to now l2 cache l2 request goes to l2 cache it goes to l2 cache it will check if it is present in l2 cache then it will be returned if it not there that is called as miss cache miss then the request goes to ddr in between these things there will be something called as memory management unit okay there will be something called as memory management unit or memory protection unit what what they do is memory management unit takes care of converting this address virtual address into something called as physical address what is happens there is uh, there it will be checked whether uh, that corresponding physical address uh, related page is it present in the ddr if it is present yes it is returned it is returned to the core if it is not present then the request there will be a dma controller connected here that what the dma controller does is it initiates a read to the solid state drive and then it performs right into the ddr so what is it involved it is what is it doing it is reading from the solid state drive it is it gives the request to the pcie controller that i want to read this specific logical block address you give me the data if the data comes to dma controller dma controller writes the data into the ddr then it informs to the system that this page table entry has been created so then a read will be again issued and it will get the data it it all happens without your notice actually see you see everything in the laptop is enclosed right you don't see all these things happening but if you look at very basic level all these things are actually happening now the unit of communication between this and this is called as cache line so let's say some cache miss has happened and we want to create that entry if that entry is present here that entry will be created here the basic unit how much amount of how much minimum data can you move from here to here is called as cache line it could be 32 bytes it could be 64 bytes it could be 128 bytes based on the system architecture okay how the architecture has been defined to be the basic unit of communication between these things is called as page. The basic unit of communication between this is called as what? Cache line. So between cache and DDR, the unit of communication is cache line. Between system memory, DDR and the secondary memory, the unit of communication is called as page. Generally page will be bigger. Most of the time it will be four kilobytes but you can even come across pages which has 8 kilobytes, 16 kilobytes like that. So what does it mean by that page is being created? That whole content, 4 kilobytes content will be moved to here. So it, the, acts, the transfer happens not as a byte or bit. The whole page content gets moved here. That page entry gets created here. So this is the basic significance of DDR. I mean, where is DDR coming, into, coming in SOC architecture? This is the importance. Why it becomes important is every operation you do where anything that involves access to the HDDR SSD has to go through DDR. You cannot bypass and directly access it. That is not possible. Next. So this is about the, uh, the DDR significance in SOC. Now let us talk about SRAM and DRAM cell basics. Uh, what, what does SRAM stand for? Can someone tell me? What does SRAM stand for? Static. I generally ask some basic questions. Idea is to keep the session interactive. Okay. Uh, what does uh, SRAM stands for? Static RAM. DRAM stands for dynamic RAM. Mm -hmm. What is mean by static? And what is mean by dynamic? Can someone tell me what exactly is static and what exactly is dynamic here? <clears throat> Why do we call uh, uh, SRAM a static? basically you don't need to refresh it doesn't lose the charge see if you even if you don't refresh it it holds the charge but when you when you remove the power the charge will go off but as long as you hold the power the charge will be stable the charge let's say you have charged it with five coulombs or something right it will the sram will hold the charge you don't need to do anything whereas dram loses the charge 
at one point the problem is the charge will come to zero level let's say this is 5c level at one point what will happen we will treat it as a logic zero ideally here it is logic one we will treat it as logic zero so in case of sram you don't need to do anything you just write one or write zero it will hold whereas in in case of uh, DRAMs, you once it comes to one level you have to bring it back to the original level again otherwise what will happen whatever was one that will become a zero because you lose the charge so this kind of periodic charging operation is required in case of DRAM because it keeps losing the charge why does it keeps losing the charge because it stores the charge in a capacitor it since it stores the charge in capacitor capacitor inherently has a leakage behavior where it leaks the charge when it leaks the charge this five coulombs loses like this do you remember that rc circuits we studied in basics of physics right we have voltage source here if you have this thing what happens whatever charge that is there in the uh, let's say there is no voltage uh, voltage source what happens whatever charge that is there in the capacitor it keeps losing in this manner so to make sure that we don't lose the information in the dram we have to keep refreshing it what is meant by refreshing bringing it, bringing it back to original charge level that is what we call as refreshing okay so with this understanding let us proceed further let's try to understand the difference between what is sram and what is dram sram is called as static since it holds the value without any requirement for refresh uh, basically sram consists of two cross coupled inverters to store each bit of information uh, what exactly is cross coupled inverter i will explain in the next slide with an example with a diagram then it requires since there are two cross coupled inverters each inverter requires two transistors right so totally four transistors and two more transistors are required to uh, take care of the word line i mean to say that we can access this uh, sram or not that will be decided through two tra transistors so totally it requires six transistors and because it uses six transistors it results in higher memory footprint i mean more the number of transistors you use more will be the die area so let's say if i can implement this with uh, one transistor let's say using six transistors it is taking 120 square mm 120 mm square square mm tell me if i only use one transistor how much area will it take to implement the same logic same amount of memory using six transistors i am consuming 120 square mm using one transistor how much it will take 20 square mm because divided by six this is what happens in the dram dram only requires one transistor sram requires at minimum six transistors next memory can be accessed in random order that is why it's called as random access memory now you may say everything is random access right in many cases it's not so because if you see uh, in case of magnetic tapes it involves you generally have to access continuous locations then you have to move the uh, the needle uh, called as attenuator to, to a new location and from there you have to access it is basically it is not sequential in order you can access in random order sram is faster and at the same time it is expensive compared to dram uh, then typically used for cache and internal registers of a cpu it is typically used for cache and internal registers of the cpu see l1 cache and l2 cache are implemented using sram only can you please read this once so the dram it uses one capacitor and one transistor more important is the transistor uh, one transistor is what is important for each bit of information see you see sram requires six transistors to store one bit of information dram only requires one transistor so because it is using capacitor to store the charge it requires periodic refresh due to capacitor leakage hence it is called as dynamic periodically we, we keep refreshing so we need, we call it as dynamic type but on a positive Push. side it takes lower memory <coughs> footprint because it is only using one transistor for one bit hence lower cost it is used where both cost and area are of concern i mean let's say 
cost and area of the concern. I want to reduce the size of the chip because I want my final electronic product to be small. Because if I increase this, let's say, imagine uh, if this this chip was this much bigger, then my overall electronic product also size will be bigger. So that is one thing. And as you increase the size of the chip area, uh, cost also will increase. So if these are these are the two things we want to reduce, we use dynamic RAM. Uh, basically, in all this, the focus is on how to make DRAM access faster. See, good, it is reducing the cost, it is reducing the area, but it is slow to access. So how do I make it faster? That is the main focus area in DRAM. Whatever we study in DDR, DDR2, DDR3 till DDR5, it is all about how do we make it faster while making sure that there are no signal integrity issues. So the few things, few concepts they use to make the DRAM faster is like prefetch buffers, uh, using sense amplifiers, uh, using uh, concept of bank groups and the concept of banks, and using the concept of ranks and channels. So these are the things that we use to make the DRAM access faster. What is prefetch buffer? What is sense amplifier? Bank groups? Everything we'll discuss as we go forward. Today's session is just to give you an overview of what is being discussed and just to give you the ddr basic understanding the ddr is the let us um, now start mm. with understanding the sram cell sram stands for what static ram okay uh, see you may say is sram same as ssram can someone tell me is ssram same as sram same as ssram Answer is yes, in all the practical reasons, SSRAM itself is called as SRAM. Same way, SSRAM stands for what? Synchronous Static RAM. Then they have SDRAM. SDRAM stands for what? Synchronous Dynamic RAM. It is also same as DRAM. Whether I say SSDRAM, whether I say DRAM, both of them are same. So can you take a look at the diagram that you see on the right hand side? What do you notice in the diagram? Can you please take a look? Basically, what you see here is two cross Not it. inverters. It's like this. The circuit is something like this. This is one inverter. You see, this is one inverter, right? Then you have inverter in the opposite direction. Sorry. I'm sorry. And the output of this, output of this becoming input to the this one, output of this becoming input to the other transistor. Mm -hmm. Then we have got two transistors here. Like this. this is being called as a word line. These are called as bit lines. Every cell has two things called as bit line and word line. Now, what is the advantage of this kind of circuitry? Can you tell me? When you say cross coupled inverter, what is the advantage of this? Can, can someone tell me what is the advantage of a cross coupled inverters? Logic retained as long as power is there. The advantage is that it is very stable in nature. That means if I just apply some charge, let's say if I apply logic voltage one, it becomes zero. Because it is zero, it will it will make it even stronger one. This will make it stronger zero. See the one will become one will give you zero. That zero will make this one even stronger. This one will make this zero even stronger. So the circuit is very stable circuit. I mean whatever you write it, it immediately holds that value. If you write zero also, it will hold the value. So it is a very stable and very quick to access even to sense what is the value you can quickly sense the value because the charge quickly comes up because of the cross coupled inverter nature. Then you may say what is why do we require these two lines can you tell me what is the significance of these transistors. What is the what is their gate is connected I mean these two transistors uh, M5 and M6 what is the gate is connected to which which cell which line that gate is connected to can someone tell me 
word line it is connected to the word line word line means when you want to read that word when you want to read this what is there inside this you make word line equal to 1 when you make word line equal to 1 what will happen can someone tell me when i make the word line equal to 1 what will happen to this transistors charge will flow to the word line from the transistor the output of the you know, cross coupled uh, so when we make the word line equal to 1 these transistors will turn on this transistor will turn on. so whatever charge that is present here okay and whatever charge that is present here uh, will be it's like whatever information present here will be available will be read line. to the bit line bar whatever information that is present here will be read to bit line bit line means if the logic is one <coughs> one will be read in the bit line zero will be read here and this turn on it access will be very fast because The, it has got it's a very stable circuit the amount of charge it is holding is very high it is very easy to sense this values that's why sram is very quick to access okay uh, other than that what you see is the voltage line and the ground line is everyone clear with this circuit how the sram works when you want to perform a write or when you want to perform a read what do you do when you want to perform a write you load the information into bit line and you turn on this uh, you this will charge these things when you want to read this again you turn on this charge will move here and you will read the data in the when you want to write this will become a driver when you want to perform a read this will become a sensor this will sense the information based on that you detect whether write uh, whether one is there or zero is there now let us understand how does this sram cell work see sram cell consists of six transistors two two cross coupled inverse inverters to store each bit two nmos to connect the cells to the bit lines then it has got how does sram read happens a uh, word line is activated with the external bit line drivers switched off see the understand bit drivers are switched off you switch off them because you don't want to drive so you switch off them inverters inside the sram drive the bit lines see whatever when you switch on you turn on that word line you make word line equal to 1 when you switch off the drivers what will happen they drive the value these things drive the value so whatever information that's present here will come on bit line and bit line bar uh, then these values are sensed by the external logic so during the sram read you turn off the external line, bit line drivers these drivers which drive this will be turned off during the sram write bit bit lines are driven those drivers will be active followed by word line transistors are activated bit line drivers are stronger than transistors in the sram cell I mean see here whatever driver you use to drive this they will be more stronger than what you get from here so they will take effect bit line drivers are stronger than transistors in sram cell hence bit line value overrides the sram cell value has everyone understood what is how the sram read and sram write uh, sram write is performed okay someone asked me a question yes. what is ddr ddr stands for double data rate sd ram i mean it should be called as ddr sd ram that's the full form actually even when you study you should study ddr 3 sd ram means what does it mean double data rate 3 synchronous dynamic ram that's how, that's the full form of the ddrs next uh, let us talk about dram cell dram cell consists of one transistor and one capacitor model that capacitor is also most of the time i mean in all the cases implemented as a parasitic capacitance that means you don't specifically manufacture this capacitance as part of the fabrication process at every at the output of every cell every transistor there will be a capacitance that's what we call as parasitic capacitance the information is stored into the capacitor information is stored into the capacitor now let us understand how the writes and reads happen into the dram cell see one thing you can notice here is there is only one transistor used there is one capacitor required in the previous sram you could see that there were six transistors 
and there was no capacitor as such and uh, there is word line can you tell me why word line will be used word line will be used to activate the transistor so that we can perform write into the capacitor or read from the capacitor the write and read will be performed through the bit line the word line is like the control signal word line is like the control signal bit line is the one where you write the data or where you read the data has everyone understood the difference between what is word line and what is bit line so yes. word line is the power supply is it okay so this same concept applies in the sram also the same meaning for word line same meaning for bit line so you activate a word line means what this transistor will be active on so either you perform a write you perform a read so let us now understand how the dram cell read happens since dram cell read what you do is the bit line is pre-charged to sense amplifier threshold voltage so there will be like ideally the voltage will be from 0 to vdd by 2 right sorry vdd 0 means what what is the logic level if if some capacitor has 0 means what is the logic logic level it has got if it has zero. got 0 coulombs 0 0 coulombs what is the logic level it is 0 right if it is charged to vdd if it is charged to vdd voltage what is the logic level 1, one. right the 0 one. means logic level 0 VDD means logic level 1. To read, during read, what you do is you keep it at VDD by 2. You keep it at volt VDD by 2. Let's say VDD is 5 volts. You keep it at 2.5 volts. And uh, let's say, let's say it has got 4.9 volts. Tell me whether it has got logic 1 or logic 0. Can someone tell me? I mean, if the capacitor is charged to 4.9 volts, what is that it has got? Is it logic 0 or logic 1? It logic is logic one, one, right? One. Now, because this has got more voltage, this has got less voltage. Can you tell me where does the charge will flow? Whether the charge will flow from here? The I'm talking about the holes, not the electrons. Okay, electrons flows opposite. Or let's stay, let's take current. In what direction the current will flow? Can you tell me? In what direction the current will flow? Towards the the bit line. Will it flow from uh, bit line to capacitor or capacitor to bit line if this is at 4.9 volts and if it is at 2.5 volts where does the current will flow from in what direction capacitor to bit line it will discharge right so, um, it, it, it is connected to ground always flow from high potential to low potential right it is at 4.9 potential it is a 2.5 potential so in this case it will flow in this direction but for that to happen what is the basic requirement this should be turned on this should be turned on right my word line should be turned on so we will turn on word line whether you want to perform a write whether you want to perform a read the common thing is what you always turn on the word line when you want to perform a read what do you do is you keep it at vdd by 2 in this case 2.5 volts you keep this at you whatever logic it has got let's say it has got logic one or 4.9 4.7 or 5 volts anything the current flows here because the current flows here the voltage will come up there will be a small swing in the voltage it will become 2.7 volts so how much swing has happened tell me how much swing happened in the voltage 0. 0.2 volt. 0. 0.2 0.2 voltage when that swing happens there will be something called as sense amplifier here. This will be called as what? Sense amplifier. This sense amplifier detects that swing, that there is a positive swing, and then it will detect that capacitor has logic one. Based on the swing that happens in the logic, they will detect. Not only that, there will be one more bit line here, bit line bar that will be actually doing sensing the reverse direction, reverse voltage. I mean. Uh, this will also sense there will be two bit lines bit line and bit line bar the sense amplifier will sense both of them and accordingly it will decide that it is a logic one or it is logic zero how does it detect logic zero let's understand let's say we keep it at 2.5 volts if it is logic zero means what it will have only 0.3 volts for example 
now the where the current will flow current will flow from here to here when current flows this 2.5 volts will become let's say 2.3 volts there's a flow of current right the sense amplifier senses that that current is flowing in this direction then it will detect that this is at logic zero so that is the role of a sense amplifier it senses right it's like sensing means what i give you a water okay uh, i tell you sense it whether it is cold or hot what will you do you put your finger and uh, tell it's cold it's hot right the same thing sense amplifier is also sensing current is flowing here or here based on the senses whether it's zero or logic one okay now here what happens the drive word line to turn on the transistor for charge to flow between capacitor to bit line if capacitor has logic one charge flows from capacitor to bit line i would rather say current actually if capacitor has logic zero the current flows from bit line to capacitor bit line has variation in the charge by delta amount see there is a delta small variation the delta i said is 0 0.1 0 0.2 like that right the sense amplifier detects this delta variation indicates as logic one or logic zero since it senses the delta variation and amplifies it is called as sense amplifier it is first what it's doing it is sensing and then amplifying it that's why it's called as sense amplifier okay tell me sense amplifier is it connected to the word line or is it connected to the bit sense line? amplifier is a part of bit line hello i am audible so sense amplifier is connected to the bit line right bit line uh, next how the writes will happen first let's understand what is sense amplifier this is how sense amplifier looks like uh, this is called as sense amplifier enable uh, sense amplifier output sense amplifier bar this is p channel enable and y select okay this is called as bit line see this is the bit line coming from the dram cell this is the bit line bar coming from the dram okay so one is coming from the uh, uh, SRAM, uh, dram this is the inverse of the dram whatever is the value it is the inverse of the dram okay they, you see here sense amplifier is nothing but again a cross coupled inverter cross coupled inverter and a logic to turn on the the sense amplifier you see if you if you look at it it is essentially uh, a sram only can you see that the if you if you see here what is it exactly two cross coupled inverters and one transistor and one transistor it's more like a uh, sram only okay so what is the significance of sense amplifier the charge stored on capacitor is too small to be read directly and is instead measured by a circuit called a sense amplifier. Okay, what is the capacitor I'm talking about? The DRAM cell has a capacitor to read the to sense that capacitor charge. It is difficult to read that. So that is where sense amplifier is used. Sense amplifier is part of the read circuitry that is used when data is read from the memory. Whenever you want to read the data from memory, sense amplifier comes into picture. Uh, there is no, there is one sense amplifier for each column of the memory cells. So there are, there are usually hundreds or thousands of identical sense amplifiers on a chip. Remember that every cell won't have sense amplifier. It's a group of rows. It's like one row, second row, third row, fourth row. Let's say it has got various columns. Each, each thing is like a cell, a DRAM cell. Each cross section is a DRAM cell. So for all these four things together, for all these four things together, Ah, I erased. Okay. Here, 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 here. For all these four things together, or uh, these things together, there will be one sense amplifier. There will be one sense amplifier. There will be one sense amplifier like this. Now, you may say, is it always only for four of them? No, answer is no. It could be even for more. We'll discuss more about that as we go forward. This is called as row numbers. This is called as column count. Sense amplifiers are, are one of the unlock circuits in DDR. I mean, if someone asks you, is DDR purely digital circuit, digital design? Answer is no. It has got analog circuitry inside that. That sense amplifier is the analog circuitry in the DDR. 
okay uh, i mean from a soc verification in their perspective even to learn the ddr protocol you don't need to go deep into it because it becomes more of an unlock circuit right just understanding the significance of sense amplifier is sufficient for you now let us understand how does the dram cell write happens see in the previous slides we have seen how the reads will happen how the reads happens you keep it at vdd by 2 and based on whether the current flows here current flows here you sense whether it is 1 or whether it is 0 whatever it is now let us understand dram cell write in dram cell write the first thing you do is whatever you want to write let's say you want to write 1 you keep it to that logic 1 logic 1 means what voltage of 5 volts then you turn it on then what will happen this charge will flow here current will flow here and accordingly this gets charged to 5 volts if you want to write 0 if you want to write 0 what do you do you turn it on you keep it to 0 volts what automatically what will happen if you give some time this will get discharged whatever is there it will get discharged because it is 0 it could be at any voltage they both will come to same voltage essentially then it becomes 0 volts bit line is charged to vdd or ground voltage based on what we want to store into the cell word line turns on the transistor charge flows from bit line to capacitor capacitor gets 0 or 1 corresponding charge okay uh, now tell me can someone tell me is sense amplifier involved during the right operation during right operation is sense amplifier involved no no Sense amplifier is not involved during write operation. It is only involved during the read operations. Next. How does this memory gets organized? I mean, we are talking about only one, one DRAM cell. Imagine a scenario like this where uh, typically what is the type of, D, what is the size of DDR we are talking about? Size of DDR we use in laptops. Just tell me any size that you can think of. Let's say you, you want to purchase a high-end laptop. 16 GB. What is the size of DDR you will be looking at? 16 gigabytes. We'll be talking about 8 gigabytes or 16 gigabytes. Right? This is the kind of DDR we talk about. Right, it could be DDR3, it could be DDR4, again it could be DDR5 also. Right? What exactly? Let's say if I say 8 gigabyte, how how much how many uh, how much memory is it? How much is it actually? It is actually 8 into 1024 into 1024 into 1024. I mean if you ignore the 24, if you ignore the 24, it comes to DRAM cells. Can I say like that? Uh, and bytes, right? It is bytes. Because bytes means points, it will become 64. Because one byte is 8 DRAM cells into 8. This many, one bit is like one DRAM cell. You can write in a capitals. What exactly is it? Um, 64 billion. Billion DRAM cells. This is nothing but 6400 6, crore DRAM cells. I'm not doing mathematics here. I'm just trying to tell you the complexity that goes into manufacturing a DRAM. Okay, DDR. I mean, I'm not trying to teach you mathematics in converting this. I'm just trying to tell you the complexity. Okay, 6400 crore transistors. Now you take a simple. Uh, imagine one DRAM cell is. Imagine just one DRAM cell. What is one DRAM is made up of what? One transistor, right? Uh, and one capacitor. Let's forget capacitor. What is the size of one transistor typically? How do you measure a size of a transistor? How do we measure gate size length of channel. transistor? Gate length channel, right? Nanometer. Can someone tell me mm -hmm. how do we in what what is that is called as that measurement? It is called as the channel length. The channel MOS length, yeah. Perfect channel length. You hear the term 14 nanometer, 7 nanometer. Right now we are manufacturing a 3 nanometer. What is the 3 nanometer? We are talking about the channel length. 
the distance Gate between the drain and the source the distance between drain and source is what we call as the channel length so let's say right now what is that we are manufacturing at let's take a realistic 5 nanometer okay. let's take 5 nanometer so 5 nanometer won't be 5 nanometer because you have to take into consideration of the size of say, uh, drain and source also the overall uh, DRAM size may be assume 10 nanometer in both length and width because it is a three dimensional device the DRAM is a three dimensional device now if i place if we place all 6400 crore DRAM cells in row in single row what is the size it will become 64 into 10 uh, 6 uh, 6.4 into 10 to the power of uh, how much 9 into 10 to the power of into 10 nanometer right which is 10 to the power of minus 8 this will become 66 meters do you agree with that it will become 66 meters if you just do this multiplication it will come to 66 meters now can you think of a uh, purchasing a dram which will which whose size will be 66 meters no right this is not possible so there what do they do what what is the solution now if you can't place everything in one line what do you do what do they do they bring it arrange. into multiple lines instead of this yeah. they try to arrange it into multiple lines now if you arrange it in 10 lines let's say uh, 64 uh, 66 meters if we arrange in 10 lines now what will be the length it will come down to 66 centimeters that is also very big right again can you think of a DRAM which is 66 centimeters. So what is the solution? They further think about it. Tell me. What is the solution? They increase the number of these things. They increase this number. Further, what do they do? What they do is they make it three-dimensional in nature. See, one one such thing, they make it three-dimensional. This is how the memory gets organized. So when you do that, what happens is uh, by the number of rows 66 meters divided by number of rows let's say we have 1024 okay. rows it comes down significantly again if you divide it into four this one or 16 arrays divide by 16 further it comes down to some centimeters the area overall area will come down to some centimeters in that case so that is how we are able to reduce the what would have taken 66 meters to arrange all of them in series down to back to square centimeters is this clear to everyone yes 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 it's so that is yes. how the s8 gigabyte memory fits into such a small area so this is how that looks like now can you understand that three-dimensional structure what i'm talking about what i spoke about uh, can you understand Yes. Each one you see, each one you see is a DRAM cell. It's a DRAM cell. See, ideally speaking, we could have arranged everything in one line, but then it would have become too long. So what they did, they converted into two-dimensional structures and they created multiple three-dimensional structure of same thing. So each one I call as memory, DRAM memory. Each one, each thing I call as DRAM memory. If I arrange like that, what do I call it as generally? Array of memories. That's why it's called as memory array. Did you understood why we are calling it as memory array? Because each one is a memory. See, it's like a two-dimensional structure is called as what? Memory. And the array of such thing is called as what? Memory array. And the corresponding, these are called as rows. See, the, each line you see here is called as a row. This is another row. This is another row. Like each line is a row. And each line, each thing you see here is called as a column, 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 column. Simple, right? I mean, any horizontal things you call as rows, any vertical things you call as a column. So a memory consists of rows and columns. Memory array consists of array of such memories. Uh, corresponding to each row, each column, there is a sense amplifier. You see, 
there is a sense amplifier present here there is a sense amplifier present here there corresponding to this column there is a sense amplifier present here if there are 32 columns can you tell me how many sense amplifiers will be present totally Thirty-two. There will be 32 sense amplifier. If the memory array size is 4, array size is 4, that means 4 memories are there in the array. Totally, how many sense amplifiers will be there in such circuit? Totally, this whole thing put together, how many sense amplifiers will be there? One, there will be 128 sense amplifiers because each column will require 4 one two three four because this memory will require one sense amplifier the one in the background requires one sense amplifier one in the third level require one sense amplifier one in the last requires one sense amplifier totally this all these four together require four sense amplifier like that at every stage you require four four sense amplifiers so collectively 32 into 4 you get 128 sense amplifier when you sense this when you sense this information that information is stored into the data buffers you see here even data buffers are four dimensional i mean three dimensional in shape structure okay at every time you cannot access entire memory you can only access one row that row contents will be moved into will be sensed by the sense amplifier it will be stored into data buffers this whatever i came up with the number right 128 that 128 is called as page size In DDR, if someone refers to the term page size, what is meant by page size is at any point of time, if you <coughs> open a row, total number of sense amplifiers. how many bits will be totally be available in the sense amplifiers? It will be in this case, what? 32 into 4, right? That is the page size is 128 bits is the page size. You may say you said till now 4 kilobytes will be the page size. It is because here we are taking a simple example. If I draw 1000 lines you can't see anything if i draw 1000 lines you will only see black thing nothing you won't see anything at all you won't be able to see these cells also hence we are taking a simple example where the number coming to 128 bits now imagine a scenario where there are 1024 rows 1024 columns each row has 1024 columns and uh, it is x4 memory means four bits per uh, four memories in each array that means it will become 4 into 1024. It will become 4 kilobits. The page size will be 4 kilobits in that case. Okay. So this is a basic about DRAM memory array. Now why do you require row decoder? You want to select among these many rows. You have to select only one row. That is where row decoder is required. When you are performing a read from the DRAM, when you are performing the read from the DRAM, you need to select one of, one of the columns only. There you require column decoder. So this is actually our DRAM. This is the additional supporting logic. Row decoder, sense amplifiers, column decoder, data buffers. This is collectively we call as DRAM wrapper. We call it as what? DRAM wrapper. Wrapper is like what? If you see... A chocolate wrapper what is there in chocolate wrapper all the things are placed into the uh, into the wrapper right that's why I call it as chocolate wrapper same way uh, if you put together everything into one thing that we call as DRAM wrapper uh, in this case memory array consists of array of memories this thing is what we call as a memory okay. array of such memories that's called as memory array in this case number of what is the number of memories in array is what is called as number of memories in one array is called as x4 if someone says x8 how many memories will be there in uh, each array if someone says it's a x8 memory how many memories will be there in each array there will be eight memories that eight memories will constitute the memory array so then we will call this that type of memory as x8 memory x8 memory means what there will be eight more 
the four more such uh, memories in the background totally eight in this okay uh, so the x4 bank composed of the decoders row decoder column decoders sense amplifiers and the memory arrays this is collectively called as one bank this is collectively called as one bank the putting together multiple such banks is what makes the DRAM chip putting together multiple banks. this is one bank this is another bank this is the third bank this is the fourth bank okay putting together all these banks is what gives you a DRAM chip so in this case we have a DRAM chip having four banks now you may ask me is it compulsory that four banks should be there answer is no you can have a memory with eight banks also so the number of banks you can have 16 banks also the number of banks is variable for just for convenience we are taking a DRAM chip with four banks how exactly this gets accessed let us discuss in the next session okay. uh, next so how do we come up with the total size of DRAM uh, actually going forward I mean when you go to DDR4 and DDR5 you come across something called as bank group group of banks we call as bank groups uh, the multiple bank groups together makes the DRAM chip okay uh, so I have to calculate the overall size of the DRAM it is the number of bank groups into number of banks into number of rows into number of columns into that x4 factor right that x4 x8 that factor we have to take into consideration a dram is implemented into bank groups starting from ddr4 and banks uh, concept of banks allows for interleaved access interleaved access improves the ddr bandwidth and lp ddr4 it allows per bank refresh let's not get into it one cent, set of sense amplifiers per bank i told you right for each bank there will be one set of sense amplifier you see there is a dedicated sense amplifiers dedicated set of sense amplifiers here 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 okay number of sense amplifier depends upon the what is the number of columns and what is the uh, size of the array let's say if the size of array is eight and there are 64 uh, columns totally how, what will be the page size can someone tell me what will be the page size page size will be 512 bits because 64 into 8 will come to 512 what is the concept of page you may be asking what is page means typically imagine you are reading a book what is page you are reading a book if you are reading a book can you read all all things at once no right at max we can read contents of one page at any time any point of time you can only read the contents of one page same way when we want to access a memory we can only access one page at a time in this case what is that one page at a time that is the amount of data that you got into the sense amplifier that is what you can write or you can read that's why it's called as a page size Someone is asking, what is that one bank consists of? We have told, right? Bank consists of rows and columns that makes one memory and multiple such memories called as memory array. Memory array is collectively called as bank. So next, uh, one set of sense amplifier we discussed. All sense amplifiers in memory array together are called as page. So this is a brief about uh, DRAM, I mean DDR concept. So we will stop the session here. Uh, any, I mean, uh, we will be continuing with further topics in the next session. I just wanted to give you an introduction to DDR and uh, how that course will be organized. Uh, any questions you have?
Sri, I had one question uh, regarding the session you said mentioned about. Am, am I audible? Oh. I mean, in the further topics, we'll be talking about the what are the frequently used terms, like what do you mean by X4, X8, X16, X32, what are the <clears> control <throat> signals, what is a page, what is a bank, what is row column, uh, what is rank, channel. I mean, everything relevant for the DDR will be talking. I mean, uh, everything pretty much required from a DDR perspective will be covered, including the signal integrity, including the termination concepts, including the calibration concepts, everything will be covered with a detailed example. The presentation itself is quite detailed, uh, around 730 plus pages. So it will be quite detailed in nature. Okay. So any questions before we end the session? Now what we would cover in uh, the LPDDR features, uh, specifically, like I, I see in the first slide, there are four 